I'm uh, John Chauvin, Director Emeritus, very happy to be Emeritus of the uh, Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research. And on behalf of my three uh, co-organizers, uh, David Kennedy, Director Emeritus of the uh, Lane Center for the Study of the American West, and our two successors, uh, Bruce Kane, the Director of the Lane Center, and Mark Duggan, who's the Director of CEPR, uh, I want to welcome you uh, to the fifth annual uh, State of the West uh, Conference. Uh, this conference is a true uh, joint venture between the two organizations, and it is an example of the gains from trade where it is possible for one plus one to equal three. We've adopted uh, the definition of the American West uh, from the uh, Lane Center. It really is the uh, North American West, and it includes uh, Western Canada and Mexico in particular. And in particular, this is not a conference solely about California. Uh, we kind of like the uh, relatively uh, short uh, conference uh, format, lunch uh, through dinner, and I suggest that no one here uh, thinks of themselves as attendees, but that everyone think of themselves as a participant. Um, you probably know uh, the agenda by now. Uh, I will just say uh, that I am looking forward to uh, every element uh, of it. We are only going to give uh, um, you a little over 30 minutes to eat, uh, so I will be back uh, in 30 minutes to uh, introduce uh, the uh, lunch uh, speaker, uh, David Crane, and then uh, he will lead a discussion on the uh, state of the states. This afternoon will feature uh, two fantastic panels, one on water markets and water uh, policy, and the other on energy infrastructure and transportation in the West. And then uh, the dinner speaker, uh, Governor Meade of Wyoming, is the chairman of the Western Governors Association. And I think we featured uh, the chairman of the Western Governors Association in each of the previous four uh, State of the West uh, conferences. And this has actually allowed us uh, to alternate between Republican and Democratic uh, governors. Uh, Governor Meade will, have, uh, will be terrific, uh, but he does have a problem. Namely, that he has uh, to follow his uh, introducer, uh, one of the most popular speakers we've ever had at CEPR, uh, the former uh, Senator uh, Alan Simpson. Um, so now why don't you enjoy your, uh, your brief lunch, and I'll be back uh, in 30 minutes. So it's now my honor to introduce uh, David Crane. I first met with David about a decade ago when he was a special assistant uh, to Governor Schwarzenegger. Before that, he was a partner at uh, Babcock & Brown, a financial services uh, company. Now he is a lecturer at, in Stanford's public policy program. He's a research scholar here at CEPR, and he is a president and co-founder of Govern for California. He has so many roles that I can only uh, list a few of them. He served on the University of California's uh, Board of Regents. He was a director of the California State Teachers uh, Retirement System, a director of the California High Speed uh, Rail Authority, a director of the Environmental uh, Defense Fund, and I could actually list six or more additional directorships, both current and uh, former. Most recent uh, and most relevant uh, to today's talk he was a member of the Society of Actuaries, a blue ribbon panel on the causes of public pensions being underfunded. And he was a member of the Volcker uh, Ravitch uh, Task Force on the state uh, budget, the budget crisis of the states. Um, based on these last two uh, recent uh, activities, and based on his outstanding reputation as a, a teacher and lecturer, we have asked him, him to tell us about the state of the states, or perhaps more appropriately, the state of the western states. So uh, David, if you would, thank you. Thank you, John, and thank you uh, to David Kennedy. Uh, and uh, I also want to thank 
uh, Mark Duggan and Joe Nation for their help with some of the slides that you'll be seeing in a second. This is a, a new experience for me, uh, going through a bunch of slides. I also had help from a number of people who are not here, uh, especially Don Boyd, who was the executive director of the Volcker Ravage Commission and is now at the Rockefeller Institute. Uh, and uh, I also want to thank uh, Ellen Moore and uh, Ben Murphy and George Morgan for all their help in setting this up today. And, hoping it'll go smoothly, smoothly so it reflects well on them as well as myself. So let's start with what I'm going to tell you about. I'm going to start sort of broadly, and then I'm going to narrow down to something which I think is an issue which has big political ramifications. To get the ground rules straight first, let's all agree we're talking about the West here. And as I understand it, at CEPR, this, or at the State of the West Conference, that's defined as the 24 states west of the Mississippi. Now, those states are very diverse. Some have no income tax, like Washington State. Some are highly dependent upon an income tax, like Oregon. Some states have oil-based economies, like North Dakota. And some states have very diverse economies, like California. So there's no single story to tell. But having said that, there is one story we can tell, at least economically. And that is, as this slide indicates, what a difference a year makes. For those of you who were here last year, you heard uh, a lot of comments about the boom in the oil belt and in North Dakota. This year, oil prices have collapsed since then. Commodity prices, I think, have followed. And you've seen a significant change in economic growth in a number of states around uh, the country. This map shows the whole country. We're going to focus on the West, and later maps will show just the West. But you can see North Dakota, if the, if the lighting is good, North Dakota is experiencing a recession, as is Alaska. Uh, you see very strong employment growth. This is this measuring employment growth year over year between last year and this year. Very strong in the West, uh, relatively strong in the Midwest, uh, not all that strong in the Rocky Mountain states and some parts of the Midwest. Uh, but that's a big change from a year ago. Now, not surprisingly, tax revenues are largely following that growth, as this slide shows. This shows percentage change in inflation-adjusted taxes versus a year ago. Uh, and again, if the colors represent it well, you'll see substantial growth in tax revenues in a number of states in the West, not as strong in other parts of the West, but very strong in the, in the far West in general. So much of the West is doing well in terms of tax revenues. But as this slide shows, some states, and many in the West, such as Arizona and uh, uh, Utah falls in this category, Wyoming, Kansas, and Missouri, still haven't reached the tax revenues they had in place before the Great Recession. This is percent change in infl inflation-adjusted taxes versus the start of the recession. And you can see California, the darker the color, uh, the greater the growth. Uh, uh, California, Texas, North Dakota, South Dakota, and those states had very he strong growth, and the states in red uh, did not have negative growth, and the rest are in between. Now, what's interesting is where those tax revenues are increasingly going, as this slide shows, for one state in particular, one that you're familiar with. This is how, changed, how California's spending changed since uh, the year before the Great Recession. So you may not be able to read all of these, but what I will show you is Spending on Medicaid is up 91% compared to the year before the recession. Payments on bond, interest payments on bonds is up 61%. Those are bonds that are approved by the voters, issued and approved by the voters. Uh, retirement benefits, which are pensions and OPEB, which are other post-employment benefits, mostly retiree health care, went up 53%. Uh, employee salaries, 30%. Correction spending went up 29%. K-12 through went up 13%. The Department of Transportation went down 44%. Social services, which is mostly which is welfare, temporary aid to needy families, went down 17%. Courts down 6%. And spending by the state on the University of California and California State University went down 4%. Just to put this in perspective, just since in the last five years, uh, since the current governor took office uh, after 2010, you know, California is on a fiscal year that runs from July 1 to June 30th. So for the fiscal year uh, June 10, or June, uh, 2010 to 2011, to now, state revenues are up about $40 billion, nearly 
yet state spending on virtually every major, every service is down, either absolutely or relatively. State spending on welfare is down a billion dollars. State spending on courts is down. Parks is down. State spending on UC and CSU is flat. So their share of the budget is down about 20%. And that's because over the last five years, state spending on Medicaid grew 60%. State spending on pensions and retiree health care grew 50%. And state spending on corrections, mostly due to two compensation increases for prison guards, is up 40%. So, uh, state, so California's revenues and revenues of a number of other states in the West are up, uh, but the money is increasingly going to one area in particular, and that's Medicaid. And this continues a long-term trend. So this is state spending on Medicaid from 2003-04, all states I think have those fiscal, uh, uh, essentially a July 1, June 30 fiscal year, through 2013-2014, and you can see the share of the budget, and th the way this is measured, is the general fund plus the portion of the state special funds that are dedicated to Medicaid. Medicaid is generally, let me just back up for one second. Medicaid, for those of you who probably who are, don't know, is government provided medical care insurance for people with limited income. Um, generally, that's financed by state governments and the federal government, and the states generally do it out of their general funds, but sometimes they do it out of their special funds as well using a certain technique which is designed to boost federal reimbursement. This is designed to show you just what's happening with revenues that states collect and how much of it has been moving to Medicaid over the last decade, and it's grown by 20%. Um, now, this process was enhanced by adoption of the Medicaid expansion in the Affordable Care Act. Uh, and uh, for those of you who don't know, under the Affordable Care Act, a significant portion of it was an expansion of Medicaid to people who were above 100% of the poverty level, which is what people before were entitled to if they were entitled to Medicaid, or those at 100% or below were entitled to Medicaid. Now it's 133% of the poverty limit or, or level or below, and that expands the number of people that are qualified for Medicaid. But it was up to the states to determine whether to expand. So uh, this process has been enhanced by the states that have elected to adopt the Medicaid expansion under the Affordable Care Act. And you can see here that the far west, California, Nevada, Arizona, et cetera, adopted it. The dark blue is those that adopted it. The orange color is those that didn't adopt it. That's 19 states. One state, Utah, is still considering it. So you see the far west adopted it uh, significantly. Uh, the Rocky Mountain states did not quite as much, and the same is true of the Midwest. Um, uh, now, as a result, enrollment in Medicaid grew fastest in those states that adopted the Medicaid expansion. So you can see in California, for example, a 38% increase from 2013 and through 2015, now one in three Californians is entitled to Medicaid coverage in California. Um, uh, you can see the other big increases, Nevada, 70%, et cetera. The states that didn't expand under the Affordable Care Act still had growth, except for in the case of Wyoming, which is interesting, but still had growth. And I suppose Mark Duggan probably would, understands the answer better than me. My guess is that's due to what's known as the woodwork effect, which is uh, a phenomenon that we in government knew about when the Affordable Care Act was being debated and Governor Schwarzenegger was making a decision after it passed whether to embrace the expansion. And the woodwork effect is this. There were a lot of people who were entitled to Medicaid before but didn't know it or didn't apply for it. People that were already at 100% of the federal poverty level or below who were entitled to it but didn't do it. And everybody knew, those who were inside government, and we knew it inside the Schwarzenegger administration, that if we had a new Medicaid expansion, where there was going to be a lot of advertising and everybody was going to be easily aware of what coverage they could now get from the state, people would come out of the woodwork uh, that uh, were already entitled to Medicaid. Now, the big difference is, under the Affordable Care Act, at least currently, 90% of the cost of the expansion is picked up by the federal government. Um, or it's 100% now, and then it goes to 90% through 2021. It's statutory, so they could change that at any time. But under the Affordable Care Act, the expansion was largely paid for by the federal government. But those that come out of the woodwork, who are already entitled to Medicaid, 
The federal reimbursement for that is what it was under the old rules. And in California's case, it's only a 50% reimbursement rate. Every dollar that California spends on those previously entitled to Medicaid, the federal government only spends an additional dollar. So uh, the net result is Medicaid spending in those states goes up dramatically, and including those states that probably, as a result, did not uh, uh, expand Medicaid, but people came out of the woodwork because of all the advertising. Now, not surprisingly, Medicaid spending is growing fastest in the states that, it, that uh, expanded, as this slide shows. This shows average annual growth in Medicaid spending. The darker the color, once again, the greater the growth. Uh, the darker colors like California, Nevada, and Oregon, uh, the growth, this is between 2010 to 2014, the growth was between 11 and 14 percent. Um, now, I don't need to tell this group in particular that there's no such thing as a free lunch. So when states decide to choose, including the one you're having right now, when states decide to spend more on Medicaid, they're going to spend less on something else, or they're going to raise taxes, or both. California is a great example of both. As this next slide shows, uh, and as all, probably everybody in this room already knew, California has the highest uh, individual tax rate in the country at 13.3%. California raised the top rate in 2012, the voters passed an initiative known as Proposition 30, I'm going to come back to that in a few minutes, which raised the top income tax rate roughly 30%, raised the sales tax rate about 3%, designed to be a temporary tax increase that uh, was designed to raise about $50 billion over seven years and uh, proclaimed to, to be for education. I can tell you that the increase in revenues derived from that tax increase went to increases in spending in Medicaid pensions and retiree health care, but we'll come back to that in a second. So you can see California has a higher tax rate, and uh, I, don't, I don't know if there's any correlation. I mean, Oregon has a high tax rate, and they adopted the expansion, but I do know California needed more money to pay for the Medicaid expansion. And as this slide shows, programs were crowded out. Hopefully you can see this slide, uh, fairly dark background. But this shows the change in spending of the California budget over the last decade, from 056 through 1516. And to make a long story short, you can see that the share of the budget, and this is measured a little bit differently for, for those of you who are going to really dr drill down on this than the way I measured uh, how Medicaid spending was an increasing share of general fund plus special fund allocated to Medicaid. This is the change, uh, this is uh, the budget defined as the general fund plus the special funds, which means revenues uh, that the state of California charges its citizens. Uh, this year, that's about $160 billion. Of the $160 billion, 17% will go to Medi-Cal, which is California's version of Medicaid, 10 years ago, 11%. So it's up 50%. Uh, uh, UC and CSU are down 20%, from 5% of the spending to 4%. Everything else is down 43%. K through 12 stays rather flat, but that's because it's protected by Prop 98. And again, for those of you who already know about this, the reason that is not 40%, which is what Proposition 98 requires, is because this is combined general fund and special fund spending. You will also see from this that the other category that grew a lot was pensions and retiree health care, and its share doubled from 3% to 6%, and you ain't seen nothing yet. Um, now, a clever pundit, and I wish it had been me, once described the federal government as an insurance company with an army. And people in this audience, I'm sure, understand why. Because the federal government, which has fewer than 4 million employees, even though it spends $4 trillion a year, is mostly a transfer agent, or significantly a transfer agent, like my daughter is now earning money, and some of her earnings are going to pay for my mother, who's on Social Security. There's a transfer, $600 billion being spent this year, I think, by the federal government on Social Security. So that's a transfer. Then the federal government is a contractor with corporations. This year, the federal government will allocate about a trillion dollars to Medicare and the federal portion of Medicaid, and most of that will end up in the pockets of hospitals, doctors, nurses, healthcare organizations, pharmaceutical companies, et cetera. And then of the roughly, these are very rough numbers, $700 billion that is spent on defense, maybe roughly $500 billion goes to military contractors. And again, that's contracting with corporations. Only 15% of the federal budget 
uh, goes to compensation and benefits for employees. And the most direct service provided by the federal government is military. So that's why this person once described the federal government as an insurance company with an army. It's really an insurance company and an annuity company with an army. Um, and now this also explains in part why politically a lot of the political spending in Washington is undertaken by the biggest feeders at that trough. Healthcare companies, military companies, uh, uh, a lot of political organizing by AARP and others because they're the biggest beneficiaries of that four trillion in spending. And then of course there's another trillion dollars of tax expenditures and that leads to spending by corporations and others who want those expenditures to continue. Um, states used to be very different. And this is what the, uh, Paul Volcker and Dick Ravitch wanted to point out so much in the Volcker Ravitch report. States have, state and local governments have about 20 million employees. And that's even though state and local governments will spend only about three and a half trillion dollars, less than the federal government. And that's because state and local governments are direct providers of services. Public education, California has six million kids in K through 12 and three million at UC and CSU and community colleges. Public safety, public uh, transportation, public infrastructure, all those sorts of things have historically been done by employees who are um, employed by the states and providing direct services. So the difference politically was that the, uh, the biggest business interest at the state and local level are government employees. And I would use the word unions to describe them. They are a business interest. This year they will carve out a, more than $100 billion out of the $250 billion that the state will spend, including federal funds this year. And local governments, it'll be roughly 80 cents of every dollar they spend. They are a business interest, and they operate politically just no differently than a pharmaceutical company. And they were historically the biggest political players. But one thing has changed now, and this is the increased spending on medical care, uh, health care. And more and more of that is not going to government employees, but instead it's going to organizations that employ healthcare employees, hospitals, both for-profit and non-profit, pharmaceutical companies, doctors and nurses organizations, et cetera. And this explains why I mentioned before the Prop 30 tax increase in 2012, which is supposed to be temporary, but there are already two moves in place to put on the 2016 ballot. Uh, one measure is led by the California Teachers Association, who is the biggest spender uh, in California politics and the biggest recipient of state spending, roughly 84% of the $83 billion that is spent on K through 12 education goes out in comp and benefits. So uh, they, they have a proposal to make Prop 30 a little bit less temporary and extend it to 2030. But the health care organizations led by the Nurses Union and the Cal California Healthcare Association and others and unions like SEIU that represent a number of healthcare workers don't like that one as much. So they want a permanent increase and another, a point higher. So that I think the top rate would be 14, maybe even more, like 14, at least 14%. And I think apply to anybody who earns more than uh, $500,000 a year. And you can understand why. Those are the two biggest feeders at the trough. And they want more money for three things. One, to pay for a massive explosion in pension costs that is about to happen, and a massive explosion in OPEB, retiree health care costs. Two, to continue to pay for the expansion of Medicaid and the, and, uh, the services that uh, the one out of three Californians want. And you'll notice there's legislation in the California legislature right now to allow Medicaid to be provided to all non-documented immigrants in California, not just a subset. And three, they want more money for, tax, uh, for uh, salary increases. And they know there won't be enough money for all of those things, so they want a very substantial tax increase. And you will see a lot about that in 2016. Now, speaking of pensions, um, this slide is designed to show you that most states actually properly fund their pensions. Now, when I say properly fund, that's using self-reported math by local and state governments, and that's using what people in this audience probably understand is a very high discount rate. Using a Joe Nation or Josh Rao proper discount rate, uh, for example, the same rate that is used to discount the interest payments that the state of California is making to me as a creditor of California, no different than a pensioner. If I was a, if I was a pensioner of the state of California receiving the exact same payments from the state that the state is paying me 
uh, for interest on bonds uh, that I purchased from the state of California, they would report their obligation to me under the pension payment at about half the size of the size of the obligation they report to me on the debt obligation. Because in one case, they get to use a super high discount rate. Using that super high discount rate, self-reported, most states are properly funding their pensions. But you'll notice there are some states in red that are not. And one of those is California. None of the rest in the West, uh, I mean, there are some in the Midwest and Rocky Mountains that aren't completely green. But California stands out, and that's because of two outliers. The California State Teachers Retirement System, on whose board I once sat before I was removed by the State Senate, is the, has the largest unfunded liability in the state. And the second is the University of California Board of Regents, where I also spent a year before I had to leave. And, uh, and they also have a massive unfunded liability. And the net result is, is that even though pension costs in that chart I showed you have already doubled expressed as a percentage of state spending. As I said earlier, you ain't seen nothing yet, and especially at school districts. The state legislature uh, last year, and Governor Brown signed legislation, AB 1469, which crammed down 71% of the cost onto school districts of the state's unfunded liability for uh, teacher pensions. That is by Cal Sturz's own math, uh, $170 billion of additional payments over the next 30 years, which is, that's, Twice, uh, that's in addition to the 170 billion those school districts are already planning to spend on pensions. And that's using the self-reported discount rate. So using a proper discount rate, they won't be spending $340 billion at those school districts over the next 30 years. They'll be spending closer to $700 billion on that. And you will start to see this show up very significantly starting in 2019, because very cleverly, they structured the increase in spending as a result of uh, this, this ramp up, this slow ramp up, to coincide with the next governor taking office, not the current governor being in office. Uh, and this is why some of you who read The Bond Buyer may have just seen an, uh, a headline uh, to quote, I think this came out two days ago, dire financial future seen for Los Angeles schools. It's a very significant issue. Um, and the teachers unions don't want you to know about it as part of the tax increase. But my guess is somebody's going to make sure it is known. Um, now, speaking of education, this slide shows expenditure per student in the Western states as of 2013, and I'll explain 2013 in just a second. In that year, California spent $11,246 per student. Texas, by comparison, spent about $8,300 per student. Um, uh, you can see that. Wyoming, where you're, the governor is speaking tonight, spent a lot of money. I can't even read the number, but they're one of the largest spenders. Uh, so California's a big spender, and this is an important point. Um, interest groups regularly don't report the truthful amount that is spent on K-12 through education in California. I mentioned the state will spend $83 billion this year. If someone from the California Teachers Association was here, was here they would say, oh, wait a minute, no. We're only spending $50 billion, which is what the state portion of what's known as Prop 98 is. Or if they were a little bit more truthful, they... Thank you. Uh, if they were a little bit more truthful, they'd say, no, the state is spending $68 billion because that's the combination of the state allocation for K through 12 under Proposition 98 plus property taxes, which are the other portion that is allocated by Proposition 98 to fi finance schools. But it's $83 billion because the federal government provides the balance. And that is the truth. And, there's, and, and to his credit, Governor Brown reports this in his budget. Um, and this year, you will see, if you go to Governor Brown's budget, on page 19 of that budget, or one of the earlier pages, you will see California this year is spending $13,500 per student. A lot of money. Um, however, graduation rates in California lag the, the graduation rates of a number of other states. And I like to focus on Texas because Texas has a demographic which is roughly similar to California. So you can see that California's is 81 of 100 students graduate, and in Texas it's 88 of 100 students. Now, some of you might say, well, wait a minute. Are we properly adjusting for all the differences between uh, California and Texas? So let's adjust for economically disadvantaged students. 
And what you will see is, when you adjust for that, California gets worse. 76 of 100 graduate versus 85 of 100 in Texas. So we're spending more, but our graduation rates are lower uh, for at least all students and economically disadvantaged students. Uh, there are also a number of other ways you can compare the data, Latino, Hispanic, uh, male, female, et cetera. It's a, it's a wonderful new software that has become available. Now, you can drill down on this a little bit more and see what it means for actual educational performance by looking at this slide, which is really hard to see. Um, but this is from the national, sorry about that, the, it's, it's the National Assessment of Educational Performance report, which just came out. And it only compares through 2013. So this is why I'm using 2013 numbers. And what these numbers show, the negative number shows the number, and it's for fourth graders and eighth graders, English and math, all combined. And it shows the number of months behind the average student is, is in that state relative to the national average. As you can see from this, and this is on an unadjusted basis, um, California is, the average student is 6.4 months behind. In Texas, they are uh, uh, 0.2 months behind. And you can compare these, this for the other Western states as well. Now, adjusting that for um, a number of things, you know, wealth, uh, uh, um, gender, um, and, and, other fa and uh, similar factors, whoops. California, oops. Well, we maybe, maybe didn't put it. Oh, yeah, no, we did. California gets even worse. So we adjusted for uh, demographics and wealth, California go a slight improvement from negative 6.4 months behind to negative 6.3 months behind. Texas goes to a positive 5.6 months ahead. Um, so, uh, I don't have an answer for how California, I do have my own answer about how California can solve this problem, uh, and maybe we can talk about that a little bit during Q&A, but uh, California is spending more money than Texas and getting much worse results. Let me conclude by just saying the following. Retirement costs and healthcare costs are going nowhere but up. And, and Stanford did a study in 2000, uh, last year, led by Joe Nason's practicum group, on what the expectation is for funding for the University of California and California State University, and they projected that they will be zeroed out, state funding for those organizations, which this year will serve 700,000 students on 33 campuses, will be zeroed out by 2021, and that's because of something a lot of you may be familiar with. California's tax revenues are correlated with the stock market, not with the economy. To give you a good example, uh, in 2008, when the stock market went down roughly 30%, the next year California's revenues were down about 30%, even though the economy in California contracted about 3%. And that's because, as a lot of people in this room know, we tax capital gains at ordinary rates. Uh, and so 150,000 people uh, provide 50% of all the personal income taxes in the state. And the combination of the two things, we have a very progressive system, the comp the, the, put, putting the two things together means you have incredibly volatile revenue. So the perfect storm is when you have declining revenue and increasing pension, OPEB, and Medicaid costs. And as I already told you, pension costs for schools are going to go way up starting in 2019. Pension costs for the state are going to go up uh, when CalPERS start. They're already starting to get more truthful, but you, they've already announced a 50% increase over the next five years, and you'll see another one after that. That's going to go up. OPEB, which is retiree health care spending, which is completely unfunded, will go up at the same time that you have a decline in revenue, then the only places the pressure can be let out, there are two places, tax increases and continued cutting of what I call the defenseless programs. UC, CSU, welfare, courts, parks, uh, those are, those, those are the, the principal ones. And that's the group that has suffered the degradation uh, over the last decade and more. So it's a, it's a very worrisome situation. Maybe John can ask me what I think the solution is for this sort of thing when we're talking. Um, and uh, with that, I look forward to your questions and comments, and thank you for having me here today. Well, David, we only have a few minutes, but 
couple things you said there that you uh, said you had more to say. One was uh, the uh, sort of inefficiency of the California education system relative to the Texas education system in the sense that they seem to get better results for less money. Uh, so what's the secret there? Well, California uh, has an incredibly centralized education system, and that's effectively a result of legislation that was passed in 1978 after Proposition 13 passed. I think the bill number was SB8, maybe it was AB8 is what it was, and that effectively is what started all the centralization of power in California and Sacramento. It's what Governor Brown has been trying to um, reverse through what he calls subsidiarity. He keeps trying to allocate more functions back to local levels and that sort of thing. Um, we have an incredibly centralized system, which makes it very easy for the California Teachers Associations and others to control the action. And that action is in the state legislature. There are 121 people who write the education code in California, the governor and the 120 members of the state legislature. How many of you are familiar with the Vergara case? So the Vergara case is the case that was brought by nine poor and minority students in Los Angeles against the Los Angeles School, a Unified School District, uh, that their rights of equal protection were violated because of the district's teacher tenure and teacher dismissal rules. And you, teachers get tenure in California after two years, which effectively means 18 months uh, when the decision has to be made. And once, they're hired, once they have it, it's virtually impossible to dismiss them. There are horror stories about Los Angeles where they, you know, one teacher did horrifying things to kids and they had to pay him $40,000 to leave. Um, so they brought this case, nine poor minority students, because the worst teachers tend to get sent to the poorest districts. And the district court in California agreed with them and said, this shocks the conscience. Well, so they won. Their equal protection rights had been violated. California should modify its tenure and dismissal rules. And immediately, California Teachers Association and California Federation of Teachers um, appealed the ruling, not surprisingly. Sadly, they were joined by Kamala Harris, the attorney general, who was not required to appeal and by Governor Brown, who was not required to appeal. And both of them filed their appeal or announced it the day before Labor Day, the Friday before Labor Day weekend, which is a conventional time for issuing a press release when you don't want anybody to read it. Uh, and the case will be decided on appeal this January, and hopefully the appellate court will uphold the ruling and force California to revisit those two things. The next step will be up to the state legislature. And if you don't have the right legislators in that legislature at that time, you can be sure that what they will do is come back with a more constitutionally protected form of tenure and a more constitutionally protected form of teacher dismissal rules. So the key will be in having legislators who will stand there with their arms crossed and say, we are going to modify the education code in response to this ruling. They could do it right now, by the way, but they're waiting for the ruling. We are going to do that. And you don't require a majority of legislators for that to happen. 10 will be enough for reasons I won't bore you with and then Governor Brown, I believe, would be willing to sign legislation like that. So I think it's going to have to be the legislature. You can't do it by initiative. All of, anybody in this room who's had experience with initiatives should already know it's a virtually impossible way to succeed. Even when you win, the legislature, which is in session all year, or has the ability to be in session all year, and considers 5,000 bills a year, and the special interests are at every one of those hearings, they will do something to monkey with that legislation to your detriment. Uh, so you got to get the right representatives there to make sure that doesn't happen. So let me ask you one more question, namely uh, the future of the UC system. I'm a graduate of the UC system. You were, got your law degree at the UC system. Uh, but uh, you just referred to it as one of the defenseless uh, interests in the state budget. So what is the future of the UC system? Well, and my wife is a graduate of UC Berkeley. Um, the uh, uh, I, I, I can only speculate. My view is, and when I was a regent, I actually thought that they should consider uh, bundling the medical centers, uh, which are very profitable and uh, probably because of increased Medicaid spending in part, um, and, and, and maybe take that public and use the revenues to help the rest of the university or whatever. But ultimately, I think it's some of the universities in that system are going to have to effectively privatize. It's already sort of happening anyway. Uh, but Berkeley... UCLA, San Diego would do fine on their own, maybe even better. Uh, I, I, the, the, the only way that will change will be if you get legislators in place who are willing to say, we are not going to, this year, let me give you one fact. This year, our state 
will spend more on the compensation and benefits of 61,000 employees in the corrections department than the state will allocate in total to the University of California and California State University. More than $6 billion on comp and benefits for 61,000, less than $6 billion on 33 campuses serving 700,000 students. And by the way, that $6 billion in comp and benefits is cash-based budgeting, not accrual basis, because governments aren't required to use that. On an accrual basis, it's like $9 billion. That will not change unless some legislators say, we are not going to do that, and we're going to allocate more to the universities. I think there's a chance for that by 2019. But either way, I think Berkeley sort of becomes private. OK, we've got a chance for just a very few questions, but we do have a chance, so get in there. Who do we have? We have a hand right back there. Um, hi, David. Quick question with regard to pensions for the teachers. If I were to wave a magic wand and assume that the California rule about the vesting of benefits uh, was to be found unconstitutional. If we were to extend the retirement age by f five years for those currently working, how much would that save on the pension funds? Do you have any idea? Um, I don't know the math if you just were to extend the retirement age by five years, but I knew what, know what exactly what I would do if the California rule, which is the rule, by the way, established in dicta in a case 55 years ago. Uh, that California unions use, and state judges, who by the way are entitled to the same pensions, use to uphold a rule which says the pension benefit that was in place, the employee was hired, is the pension benefit they get, even if the next day the state decides to end pension benefits for all new employees, they get whatever was in place the day they were hired, uh, which is not the way it works anywhere else, including under ERISA. Uh, if that was ruled unconstitutional and you could modify benefits for current employees with respect to years not worked, then the model I would take on is Gina Raimondo's model in Rhode Island. She, uh, Gina Raimondo, who is a, an example of a truly courageous governor, led the pension reform in Rhode Island, which cut their unfunded liability in half. And very significantly, a lot of the money comes from the adjustment of the COLA. So that might be even more valuable than five-year extension on the work life of the teachers. And I don't know the answer to your question either, but I think the uh, short answer is a lot. It would help a lot. <laughs> uh, but I don't know how much exactly. But uh, the California rule, I think, is ridiculous. Literally, just to repeat what he said, you work for the state or actually for, you know, for city governments that are under the plan for one day. You've only worked one day, and they cannot cut your pension for 30, 40 years. You're accrual. Um, Future workers, but if you're just under the wire, you've worked one day or one month, you're, you, you've got that same generous plan and they cannot cut it. No private employer would uh, put up with such a system. One more. One more. What do we have? Two more. Uh, yeah, I have okay, a question getting back to the uh, Medicaid. Uh, Recovering some money on medical care seems to be an important way to either nationally or state. Um, if we do, uh, and the big dispute is, uh, much of it was over the ACA, the Affordable Care Act, but do you see the state of California moving towards a universal single payer as a state if there continues to be no action at the federal level? The short answer, no. I mean, if Joe Nation was here, it's really interesting. Joe pointed out the other day, this may be the first year that a legislator in California has not put up a single-payer bill. I mean, Governor Schwarzenegger had to veto one every year. It was usually put up by Sheila Kuehl, State Senator Sheila Kuehl. But this is the first year no one put one up. So the, it, right now it's looking like there's less of an inclination to have California move in that direction. But when you think about it, when Medicaid, which is single-payer, is being extended to virtually everybody, and now they want to extend it to all undocumented employ uh, workers or all undocumented Californians. That's effectively single payer for a very substantial part of the population. One more question. Wait, wait for the mic. Do you see any hope for a reduction in the amount of money we're spending on corrections? Um, with a more courageous governor. Uh, full disclosure, I supported the current governor and donated money to his campaign in 2010. And he had told me when he was mayor of Oakland 
that he thought the biggest mistake he made during his first term as governor, or second term, in the late 1970s was signing what's known as determinate sentencing, the determinate sentencing law, mandatory minimum sentences. And if you look at the math, if you look at California's prison population, it's like a hockey stick right after that. They, legislators love to blame everything on voters, like three strikes. That just steepened the curve a little bit. Determinate sentencing is everything in California, and the governor and the legislature could repeal, could address that, modify it tomorrow, and he hasn't touched it. And I've learned that what Governor Schwarzenegger's chief of staff, Susan Kennedy, a longtime Democrat, said the day I told her I had voted for Jerry as governor uh, in November of 2010, I, she said, why? And I said, he's going to be Nixon to China. He's going to solve all these issues. And she said, David, he's the most cautious politician you will ever know. And she was 100% right. He will only do what the legislature will let him do. And until you either get a legislature in there that is willing to address determinate sentencing, uh, then you, I think, will not find much of a legislative change there. By the way, in the last five years, Governor Brown and that legislature gave prison guards two salary increases, even though they were already the highest paid prison guards in the country by a long shot. And in doing it, for example, in 2011, when they granted the first compensation increase, that year they cut welfare, UC, and CSU three times. I mean, they are an incredibly powerful union that most legislators to date have been cowed by, and I hope to be part of maybe changing that a little bit. I think that, who knows. Okay, we're gonna run this thing on time, so I wanna thank David. Thank